Hello, everyone, again. On to our next session, and this is Elenia Salvadori from Data in Motion, who's going to tell us a little bit about what sounds like a fascinating journey between disciplines from astroparticle physics onto OSGI. An interesting combination. Over to you. So, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Elenia Salvadori, and uh, I'm working for uh, uh, Data in Motion Consulting. So, today, as the title says, uh, I want to tell you just a story of a journey, and uh, in particular of my journey, which brought me from the world of physics to the world of OSGI. And as you probably can imagine, these are two completely different worlds. Or are they? We'll see. So first, uh, let me just tell you some words about uh, Data in Motion. So it's a company uh, founded in 2010, and uh, we are located in Vienna, in Germany. And we provide consulting, independent uh, R&D, training and development for a wide range of industries. So from the medical to the traffic, uh, public sector and smart cities. But uh, what about me? So as I already told you, I'm a physicist. And here you can see a nice picture of me after my PhD defense in Marseille. And as you can see from all these things that are surrounding me in this picture, I was used to work with a completely different technology back then. In particular, I was part of the Antares Can Freenet collaborations. Here I put the link in case some of you may be interested. And uh, my PhD work was focused on the study of neutrino oscillations. So Antares and Kentrinet are neutrino telescopes and are situated at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, close to the coast of Toulon. And they try to detect these weakly interacting particles, which are called neutrinos. And by reconstructing the energy and the incoming direction of these particles, uh, what we tried to do was to infer constraint on some theoretical parameters which regulate this phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. You look quite off board already. So <laughs> I think I stop here with physics. Uh, so the important point here is just uh, that I've never heard about OSGI or Eclipse before arriving to Vienna. And I moved to Vienna exactly four days after my PhD defense because my husband got a job there. And I had to find a job myself, right? So uh, I decided to change a bit uh, my path and try to find a job into the private sector. And these were basically the skills that I tried to sell in the private sector. So I had some programming skills, mostly C++, which is the language I developed mostly all my analysis with. Then I had, of course, some statistics and data analysis background, which were the core of my PhD work, and a problem-solving approach. So luckily for me, Mark and Jürgen believed in these skills, and they decided to hire me. And um, which brings me to the, to the next question. So why exactly am I here today? Relax. I'm not here to teach you anything. <laughs> I, I keep learning uh, new things uh, every day. And I think I have still a lot to learn before coming to an Eclipse Kong and give you a technical lecture. But today, what I want to do is just to share my first impressions on the OSGI technology and some of the tooling that um, I started to uh, to use during this uh, first year. And I want to give you this perspective from uh, an outsider point of view, as I am. So as a person coming from a completely different uh, environment. So my first impressions. Since day one at Data in Motion, I had to become familiar with a lot of different new terms and technologies. So first, I had to learn how to program with Java which, okay, it's not that different um, with respect to C++, you may say, but you have to keep in mind that I'm a physicist. I'm not a programmer. So all the things that I did with C++ were, mm, okay, <laughs> but uh, not uh, uh, from a programmer point of view. So uh, already passing from C++ to Java for me was kind of a big step. Then I had to work with the modeling framework, I had to start uh, developing RCP, and then of course uh, all the OSGI related um, environments, so services, uh, injection, and uh, a lot more. So was it love at first sight? Not really, I have to admit. I actually remember my first day at work when Mark tried to explain to me 
what they were working on. And he made this huge diagram at the blackboard and started using all these terms. And he was talking to me as if I had some kind of background regarding all this stuff. And I was basically like, mm -hmm, yeah, 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 sure. And then I arrived home and I was, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> I didn't understand a word. And I was pretty scared, I have to admit. But then I took a deep breath. I started Googling some of the terms that I heard, try to understand them. And from the next day, I of course started working with them. So step by step, I started put everything into more or less hopefully the right context and uh, I start learning something. And now it's almost a year that I'm working uh, for data in motion consulting. So um, I can at least try today uh, to give you my outsider's view of uh, what's OSGI. And uh, especially I want to, to tell you what, what, which are the things that I tried, uh, that I found really cool and what's the difference between what I was doing before. So, first of all, I learned about modular architecture. So, you have to know, I never had to develop a whole application before. And even if I was working uh, during my PhD with some modular software, I wasn't really aware of that. And for sure, I wasn't able to appreciate their potential. But now, working with OSGI, I started learning which is the difference from a monolithical and a modular architecture. And I started really to appreciate the benefits of this uh, uh, modularity. So the fact that an application is built by uh, modules, which uh, are the OSGI bundles, and with each module is responsible for one particular functionality. And the thing that I found really cool was when I started working with different projects and see how by combining in a different way the modules, I, I could obtain different results, which is exactly uh, what you do when you're playing with Lego, right? So the second thing that I found uh, quite amazing uh, was when I realized that actually there are some analogies um, among, uh, from one side, the developer cycle, let's call it like this, um, and the application that he is developing, because uh, um, he first has to plan the, the application, then start writing it, building, testing it, of course, and then make a release out of it. And then the application itself has it, its own life cycle as well. But then the, the most amazing thing is that also the bundles inside the application have its own life cycle. And uh, uh, the thing that I, I found quite hard to understand at the beginning was that this is uh, uh, all a dynamic environment and you can act on this uh, life cycle without breaking completely your application or having to restart everything from scratch. And then, of course, services. So um, when I was doing my PhD, I was basically both uh, the developer and also the final user of my analysis, right? Because I wrote my code, then I launched it, and then I analyzed the results. But here, the things uh, have changed. So uh, when you are developing an application, the thing that happens is normally that uh, your boss or your client comes to you and ask you for um, a particular functionality. And what you have to do, you sit down together, you try to understand uh, uh, exactly what he needs, and then you stipulate some kind of contract, right? And then you have to provide at the end the final product, which have to uh, be compliant with the contract you have stipulated in the first place. And that's basically exactly how services work, right? Or at least how I explain to myself uh, how services work. So they, they do basically the same as you are doing with your client, but uh, uh, inside of your application. And this is something I found really, really cool. Then at Data in Motion, um, we used to approach um, basically every project with a modeling approach. And this uh, is something that I didn't find that hard to, to grasp as a concept. 
because I realized by, by working with that, uh, that uh, it was something that uh, I was basically already doing for my entire PhD. And I found this concept uh, um, quite interesting because modeling is not uh, only a technical tool, let's say. It's, uh, uh, it's really a real mind exercise. Because uh, uh, when you want to uh, build a solid model, you don't have to jump uh, immediately into the, the problem, right? You need to take a step back and analyze it and really understand your problem before you can uh, model it. And at the same time, you have to understand all the ingredients uh, which are part of your model and understand how they relate to each other. And then this... Uh, um, modeling effort that you that you do, I think it repays you by teaching you how to recognize similar structures and how to generalize concepts. And this is also something I found very useful when uh, I started working on different projects, because uh, I was able to um, realize that uh, if I had a problem, I maybe have already solved it for another project. So the, um, the solution that uh, uh, I found for one project could have been applied also to the other. And this, if you think about it, is not that different uh, from what a physicist does, because a physicist also wa um, wants to model his data or a physical phenomenon. And some uh, um, different uh, phenomena can be, at some level of abstraction, be modeled by the same model, right? So that's, uh, that's why I didn't find that hard to, to grasp this modeling concept. Another thing that I learned during my first year at Data in Motion um, is the importance of having a clean and well-documented code. So, as I told you before, uh, during my PhD, I was basically the developer and also the client of my whole uh, analysis. So, the question that I used to uh, ask myself about my code was this, does it work? And if the answer was yes, okay, I was basically done, right? But this was before. So, now I learned to ask myself, uh, of course, this question again. But if the answer is yes, now, I'm asking myself a lot of other questions. So first, I'm not working alone. And there are very high chances that my code will be used by someone else. So I need to be sure that also another developer could understand it. At the same time, it can be that a project that you need to work uh, on the same project maybe after a month because you need to add some new functionality or you need to change something. So this is another question I ask myself. Another important thing that I'm learning to do, but uh, I have to admit I'm still struggling with, is keep attention to not to repeat the same logic more than once, right? Or maybe if you have the same logic, just try to put it in a separate method and use that. And of course, I learned the importance of testing your code. At the beginning, it looked to me as a wasted of time, <laughs> I have to admit. But then when I, when I learned about it, uh, I found it that it's not actually uh, time wasted, but it's uh, time invested. Because if you are able to build a proper test for your code, when you have to change something and you maybe make a mistake accidentally and break something, if your test is very well done, it will tell you. And you probably will know already how to fix it. And then, of course, a lot of other questions. So if you would ask me uh, which were the hardest parts during this first year, I would for sure say get familiar with all the terminology this, that this new world has. Uh, and in particular, not only remember the terms, but uh, uh, put them into the right context. Because as I told you before, I had to learn a lot of things since day one, and sometimes uh, I get confused to uh, what, which things belong to which context. So this is still a work in progress for me. And then, of course, uh, uh, understand how to work with asynchronous programming. So this uh, is a whole dynamic environment which I was not used to. And even if I understand the concept and I realize that these are all very powerful things, sometimes it's really hard to understand them and work properly with them. So
So what were the things that helped me the most? For sure, documentation. So I read a lot of uh, OSGI specification, uh, books, and of course a lot of Googling, because there's always someone who had the same problem before, right? Asking questions, uh, which is something I have to admit I'm not very good at, but uh, luckily for me, I work in a very friendly environment, so this helped me a lot, and you never have to be afraid of asking questions if you don't know something. And then um, a physicist approach, namely the thing that I was trying to sell when arriving to Vienna. And this, I think, it helped me a lot because uh, at the end, it's true that those GI and uh, um, astroparticle physics are two completely different worlds, but uh, um, the way I approach the problem, it's basically the same, right? So I change context, that's true, but uh, I didn't change uh, my, uh, my way of, uh, of approaching a problem. So to conclude, this was a really changing year for me. I left basically my comfort zone to enter this, uh, this new world. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that I did that. Uh, I keep learning things every day, and this is something that for me it's really important. It, it was really important when I was a, a researcher, and, and it's still really important because it's the way you don't get bored, right? <laughs> And I'm also glad to be, to be part of this new community and I'm starting feeling less as an outsider and more like a part of this community. And I hope in the future to, um, to could come here and um, give you um, maybe a more technical lecture and uh, talking about one of the projects I'm working with. So I just want to leave you with this uh, uh, quote. Uh, which uh, I think it fits uh, quite well uh, with uh, the journey that I made. So, thank you. <laughs> That's a tricky question. <laughs>